This is my best mate, Mitch. In September of 2018, we were over in Japan having the cycling trip of our lives. The idea of the trip was simple. Find as many Japanese hills as we could and bike directly up them. But unfortunately for us, Mother Nature had other ideas. We were about to witness her destructive power firsthand, and it was an experience that neither of us would ever forget. So here we were, we were in Japan. It was turning out to be everything we'd hoped for. Beautiful mountain roads leading us up into serene mountainscapes. As the weather turned, we fled and land, as we knew that we had to get one of the big ones ticked off. The one and only Fujisan. Show me a mooks. We thought we'd do a warm up for the big boy by going round all the lakes that sit at the bottom of Fuji. All in all, it should be about 80k, and we could finish at the top of Fuji, completing an epic day's riding. What's worth mentioning at this point is that in the stress of trying to get our bikes put together and get on the road, we'd neglected to bring any food with us whatsoever. All in all, it ended up being about 100k before we got to the bottom of Fuji, which you can see here is the gate you pay to go up the bus access road. As you can see from the camera, it was about 100% humidity and we were sweating out our eyeballs. And what happened next can only be described with one word and that is bonk. As we drowned our sorrows in the hotel, the reality of what was about to hit us became very clear. Typhoon Jebby was a Category 5 super typhoon that hit Japanese shores on September 2nd, 2018. It was the strongest typhoon to hit Japan in almost 20 years. It had maximum recorded wind speeds of over 200 kilometers per hour and an estimated net cost to Japan of 12.8 billion US dollars, making it the third costliest cyclone in Japan's history. It flooded international airports, it crashed boats into bridges. And where were we? We were trying to exact our revenge upon Fuji, who defeated us the day before. I don't have any footage of us doing it. All I have is a Strava file proving that we got up and back. But it was without a doubt one of the wettest and coldest rides of my life. 
I'll never forget the look of the parking warden as he hurriedly got tourists onto buses as they attempted to close the mountain, and two shivering cyclists struggled to get anything warm to come out of this vending machine. The weather was worsening with every second, so we decided to just get off the mountain as quickly as we could. The next day we fled south in an effort to put as much distance between us and Jebby. We foolishly thought this would give us the best chance at riding all of the hills we had planned, mostly in and around Kyoto and on the island of Shikoku. As we rode around the shores of Lake Biwa, we were lulled into a false sense of security thinking that there was no damage anywhere, everything looked like it was functioning perfectly normally. But what we didn't realise is we were biking our way right into the path of Jebby's destruction. What we would see in Kyoto would leave us completely gobsmacked. Having arrived in Kyoto, we felt like we'd acclimatised quite well now to the Japanese humidity and weather. We'd had a nice flat day yesterday and we're rearing to go for the Kyoto Hills. We'd planned an epic route the night before, a route we'd affectionately named the Kyoto Big Boy. Show me your moves. It was supposed to be about 160k with about 3,000 metres of climbing in it. It would take us in a giant loop all around the foothills of Kyoto and supposedly have some epic views in it. The small villages we went through were completely deserted and none of the shops or any of the vending machines were open or working. We noticed a few trees down around the place but didn't think too much of it at the time and just kept cycling on. Fuck bro. Any trees down. Oh snap. No wonder the f***ing power's out. All the locals we saw were really relaxed and didn't act like anything was wrong at all, so they didn't give us any reason to turn around. As we climbed up we started noticing a lot of debris on the ground. For me at least, these were the best roads we'd had all trip and I was really keen to keep going. As we got to smaller and smaller mountain roads, we started to notice larger trees being downed. There were points where there was complete impasse in the road, and locals worked to try and clear the road. The further we went, the worse the damage got. Some points there were huge power poles that had been felled along with trucks that had been crushed by trees falling over the road. At this point with all the twists and turns we were way off our planned route and had no real idea where we were other than the fact that we were probably miles away from Kyoto. Some of these villages in the mountains were completely destroyed. There were power lines everywhere and we had to just hope that they were all off. At this point I started to get quite worried about what we were doing and what our options were. I think probably we would have turned back about this point if we hadn't met this guy up in front of us. He was a local Japanese cyclist and he seemed to be doing the exact same thing that we were doing.
we started to just follow him. And we couldn't speak any Japanese and he couldn't speak any English, so there wasn't much of a um, dialogue about it. We just hoped that he knew where he was going. I was super unsure about what we were about to do here. It seemed like this was incredibly dangerous to be clambering over down power lines and fallen trees. But he lifted his bike over and gave us a big smile and a thumbs up, so I wondered if he knew something that we didn't. It started crossing my mind as we clambered through this tree graveyard about what we would do if one of us double punctured or we had some other kind of mechanical because there was no way that a car could access out where we were. We'd gone through so many blocked areas. Some parts were okay but you get to bits like this which were just completely unrideable with trees that were held up by the strength of only power lines. And I would love to know what was lost in translation here, because we couldn't really communicate. We could only just smile and thumbs up. Part of the reason I think we were so determined to keep on going was that we'd already biked about three and a half hours to get round to even this far and the thought of turning back and having to go all the way back was just too painful. And this is facing towards Kyoto trying to get down the hill to it. And the further we got the worse the damage got and it was quite obvious that it wasn't going to get any better but anyone who's sat in a four hour queue will know it's so hard to cut your losses and go once you've invested that much time. And this guy was so nice really, he was just looking out for us who were clearly completely lost and like here he's lifting my bike over the power pole for me and he took care of us the entire way. And so up ahead I spot this red car in front of us and I'm so stoked at this point because I think someone's managed to drive up here so therefore it must be passable down. But as we got closer it became obvious that the car was abandoned and someone had fled their vehicle during the storm. With trees crashing around it's quite a terrifying thought. It's a bit hard to tell from this angle but the amount of trees ahead of us is completely unpassable. There's no physical way we could have dragged our bikes through there, let alone ourselves. So we turned our bikes around and we walked all the way back. And I'm really glad that we did, because we got contacted by another cyclist who had done the same route the day before, and he showed us some of the photos of what was below where we got to, and it looked absolutely horrendous. Looking at their Strava ride, it took them literally hours to get down to Kyoto from where we were. So thanks for the photos, Jeffrey, and uh, I'm glad that we didn't do what you did. We climbed all the way back up, and in the end we did actually manage to find a more direct route down again, and our mate took us the whole way home, all the way through Kyoto, because he didn't want us to get lost. We never got the guy's name, but if you're out there, mate, you're an absolute legend. And I hope one day I can repay the favour to a foreigner who's lost in my country. The last thing on our list was the Shimanami Kaido Cycleway, 
70 kilometres of unbroken cycling paths that cross the Seto Inland Sea from the island of Honshu to Shikoku. Hopping from island to island over giant suspension bridges, it is one of the most impressive pieces of cycling infrastructure I've ever seen, and well worth the trip. And that was basically the last big ride of the trip. In light of all the destruction we'd seen, we decided to just get back north again as soon as we could. So we uh, went back to Nara, made friends with the deer. <laughs> and rounded off our Japanese experience watching a baseball game in Tokyo. So thanks very much for watching. If you like this kind of cycling content, then please consider subscribing, it would mean a lot. I really enjoy putting these kind of videos together and writing the music that goes with them. Any of the music I make for this I'll chuck up on my SoundCloud so you can go and have a listen there if you want to. And otherwise, we'll catch you in the next one.